So good morning to all of you, and I welcome you all for the National Symposium on Ocular Trauma Cutting Edge Technology. Uh, Dr. Lani is a little busy, the chairperson in the traffic, and the other people gradually come in, the speakers will walk in. So uh, we have Dr. Akshay Nair, Purinder is busy, Kuresh Mohan Rajan. So we'll start with Dr. Mohan Rajan's talk, if you're prepared. Okay, so he's a prolific orator. I've heard his talks a number of times, full of laughter. So he'll be speaking on uh, FACO in the complex traumatic cataract. And then we can have Dr. Das is here. And then Sandeep is here, so he can yeah. go ahead with the second talk. Hmm. Okay, um, uh, thank you Sanjeev, Shakin, and uh, good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank the AOS for this wonderful opportunity. I'm going to take you through some uh, challenging traumatic cataract cases. And uh, as you know, traumatic cataract is a totally different ball game because of pre-existing PCR, zonal dialysis, post sinicae, hydrodialysis, corneal problems can be there, calcified anterior capsule, nucleus drop, and all these problems can occur. So you need to have a plan A, plan B, plan C, and need to have a good pre-operative assessment as well and need to do a good counseling for these patients. So let us go through this uh, different scenarios. This is a case one, you can see here, is a blunt injury, 16-year-old male. It's almost an intermittent cataract, okay? As I'm doing the FACO, you can see there is a barrel on the posterior capsule. Are you able to see the barrel there? Yeah. So it's a, it's, whether the barrel is there because of the previous PCR, or it was made because of this uh, FACO, I'm not really sure. Probably possibility of pre-existing PCR in these patients. So fortunately, the cataract was soft and I was able to just put viscoat and bring it, bring it up. And I was able to uh, remove the nucleus because the nucleus, 16 year old, the nucleus was not very hard as well. You can see the huge tear in the PC. And uh, this is a, probably a pre-existing tear and then immediately go in and do a bimanual vitrectomy, anterior vitrectomy and put a lens in the sulcus and the patient did very well and had 6-9 vision. Again, you can see 8-year-old stick injury and uh, you can see there is a corneal, small corneal tear and you can see uh, there is a tear on the anterior capsule as well. Already a pre-existing Argentina flag sign because of the stick injury, you can see that Argentina flag sign on the anterior capsule. And being a young fellow, it's only a cortical, almost like a cortical aspiration. I did a irrigation aspiration. Every time you come out, when you have a PC tear, you need to inject visco and come out of the eye. And then I converted that uh, <coughs> one arm of the Argentina flag sign of the capsule into a capsulorexis and another arm into a, a semicircular capsular axis as well. And you can see that uh, I was able to put an implant, a single piece lens, uh, implant uh, uh, eye oil with the <coughs> haptics uh, facing uh, perpendicular to the PC tear or, or the anterior capsular tear. So another patient can see this a shuttlecock. The shuttlecock injuries are probably the worst as far as I anterior segment is concerned. You can see that <clears throat> I put the CTR right in the beginning of the surgery and because there is a very gross, uh, uh, what do you call, zonal dialysis and I went ahead and did the FACO and the patient did very well. Again, a young fellow, a young uh, girl, 10 year old with a stone injury and you can see there is a very, very gross. I used to fix these lenses with sutures but nowadays what we are doing is we are doing a, a, a pass planar lensectomy. It makes life easy for us. 
and then went ahead with the scleral fixation glued IOL in this particular child and uh, the child is doing very well. It's about almost uh, uh, eight or nine year follow up for this child. The child is doing very well with maintaining vision of 6-6, six, six, best corrected of course. <coughs> and uh, so we used to fix, because it's a very gross subluxation, sometimes we don't, uh, it's very difficult to fix with the, uh, with the difficult to do a capsulorexis and even fix this. So another patient, you say again, 25 year old male, blunt injury, traumatic cataract, pre-existing PCR. You can see as I am trying to aspirate the the so-called nucleus and the cortex and the epinucleus, there is a huge, there is a sudden deepening, which means there is a existing, the pre-existing PCR which opened up during the surgery and it is very difficult to manage, especially when you have a denser cataract. Sometimes the nucleus can go inside and if a sink and again anterior vitrectomy, always remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex and putting a multi-piece lens in the sulcus and fixing it in the back. We have access to IOL master 700 now. The advantage of IOL master because the Swepsos OCT is able to give an idea of the posterior capsule. So you know exactly in traumatic cataract, even a very dense cataracts can penetrate <coughs> whether the posterior capsule is intact or even a posterior polar cataract, you can find out whether there is any pre-existing degessence, you can plan your surgery accordingly. So again, this patient has a, a pa patient had a I think a cracker injury, I am going ahead with the, uh, you can see the fibrosis of the anterior capsule which is there and then going ahead with the uh, regular capsulorexis, sometimes it is very difficult to do a capsulorexis as well and you can see that uh, I am doing a bimanual younger patient, a bimanual IA, bimanual actually is better because you got better control in this uh, especially when you have a PCR or a, or a suspecting a PCR as well. And uh, you can see there is a small PCR. Fortunately for me, it's fibrosed because it is a long term. So it's about uh, almost uh, six months after the injury, cracker injury. It was very common in uh, in uh, in Tamil Nadu because we have the cracker factory, uh, main uh, the capital of crack, uh, cracker factory in Sivagasi, and wherein crackers during the Diwali time they have. Again, another patient can see here. There's a shuttlecock injury, the iododialysis. And you can see all the problems can occur in shuttlecock injury. There can be subluxation, hydrodialysis, there can be angle injury and uh, angle recession glaucoma and you can have problem in the cornea as well. So what I'm doing is there's a synecae there. I'm retaining that synecae because I don't want that iris to come forward. So this I think is something which you need to improvise when you are doing traumatic cataracts. It's not like the regular cataract. See, I'm retaining that... Uh, uh, thing and so that I don't want to get the iris there and retaining the sinicae. Then once I remove the cataract, I will remove the sinicae or open up the sinicae and repair the hydrodialysis. Before that, I will just implant the lens and go ahead. So, it is something which you need to do because otherwise if you release the sinicae, the whole iris, otherwise you need to put iris hooks there. So, sinicae itself is holding it. Again, another patient can see here is a patient with a corneal tear, intumescent cataract. Okay, the intumescent cataract, uh, uh, we were not, uh, the patient was also not very sure what happened actually. To a surprise, no, this is what I think it's something like a, uh, opening up the abdomen, laparotomy. No, you do not, it's a temple of surprises. So when you open up, you'll know exactly what is the problem in traumatic cataract. So as I'm doing the rexis, you know, there is a tear. I thought, okay, a tear will go on. See, but I found there is a, something there. There is an intralenticular foreign body, okay, which is obviously missed uh, by any of this thing. So, the patient's also history was not very clear. And this patient was referred to us by another ophthalmologist. And uh, you can see here, intralenticular foreign body. I brought the intralenticular. Fortunately for me, the rexis was quite intact. And that area also, the zonules were very intact. And you can see that I brought it up, making sure that I put viscoat. And uh, the the vertical, the long axis of the intraocular foreign body was there and we uh, brought it out and this patient uh, also did very well. So, this jelly cut to bulgur injury is very common in Tamil Nadu, wherein they play with the, there's a game wherein they play with the bulls. Again, a traumatic subluxated cataract, very soft cataract. 
I was a little overconfident. I was planning a glue diol for this patient. You can see the past plan, my infusion, the flaps as well. I thought I'll be able to just uh, uh, phaco this entire, uh, or what do you call the intracapsular phaco. You can see, but the whole thing is going inside. So this is what I think you should not be overzealous. So this is overconfidence which can actually uh, make your things worse, and the whole thing went inside. So what happened was I. Uh, I uh, did the glued eye oil in this case, and then subsequently went past plana, three port. I put uh, past plana. I put the glued eye oil, and then went in and did the vitrectomy, and uh, got again. This is what I think Sanjeev uh, mentioned. There's a pressure cooker injury. We have reported a huge amount number of pressure cooker injury long time back, and we took it up also with the prestige uh, uh, TTK company. Prestige. At that time, the pressure cooker valves were defective. And one of the pressure cooker it can be very very bad because the pressure cooker know that uh, the uh, this weight on top of the pressure cooker when the pressure when it goes up it can hit the ceiling and hit come back and something like a how do you call missile come and that's what has happened to this uh, lady and you can see this uh, this uh, the lens it is a phaco seal actually and the entire lens is outside and uh, and uh, after that there's a huge uh, uh what do you call the um the uh, corneal tear as well corneal scleral tear which i repaired you can see that huge underlying corneal scleral um, the, the scleral tear which i repaired you can see the ciliary body through and through and uh, this patient also we left them left the patient aphakic in the first sitting and subsequently so the advantage of uh, the catalyst is the, the femto we have access to this especially when you have this young lady from saudi referred to us you can see the traumatic cataract the advantage is that the rexus is there the chopping is there and this lady has traumatic cataract zonular uh, dialysis you can see the hydrodialysis as well so i was able to do because the rexus is the most challenging in a subluxated cataract and if you have uh, something like a catalyst of the femto which uh, makes life easy for you And then went ahead and put in a thing, and then went ahead put a thickness lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll close in another one minute. And this is just to show you another patient with the with with the subluxated cataract. You can see here, and uh, 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 I'm doing a femto. And uh, these are the different uh, scenarios we can see. The take home message is high ward hydro dissection, low flow pa parameters. slow motion phaco anticipate pcr bimanual vitrectomy anticipate the worst have a plan a plan b and plan c for all these patients thank you again for the wonderful opportunity thank you dr mohan rajan for a lovely uh, presentation uh, by the time we have the second speaker dr sandeep gupta has been waiting here uh, this his original topic he was not aware of it so he is speaking his own topic cataract surgery with corneal trauma uh dr mohan rajan i think in the first case what you were talking about why you were referring so much to the air bubble it most of the time it's mostly because even in a traumatic cataract can it be mostly because of the phaco machine itself phaco machine itself you yeah mean, the uh, air bubble which you mentioned in the first case no, i didn't mention any air bubble what you did mm -hmm. okay anyhow and second question is yeah. that if you are doing a corneal uh, suturing would you like to operate in the same sitting or would you like to wait for some time no if it's a, if the cataract is uh, uh, leaking and there's a significant trauma to the anterior capsule mm -hmm. lot of lens matter is there in the anterior chamber i would do it in the same sitting in the same i'll do the corneal tear and the same the same sitting okay yeah i'll take the uh, measurements from the other eye so i would like to add like in the foreign body in the lens i think when the patient comes with a trauma the detail history is very important we must take the history and in all these patients if it's not possible at least one x ray of the face and the eyeball is very important so that uh, any foreign body inside the lens or the surgery is detected much before the surgery you start so you accordingly prepare yourself second thing you have already covered with the uh, with IL 700 not able to see it properly not able to hear him mike yeah mike. yeah okay so the history proper history the mode of injury is yeah. very important to be taken well before the start of the surgery so if the patient has an a uh, foreign body threat so what kind of uh, instrument he was working with what kind of uh, foreign body stuck to his eye whether it has fallen off or not 
is important to be you know interviewed before surgery so that in case the patient has intraocular foreign body retained intraocular foreign body so some sort of a x-ray at least which is a mandatory of these patients to be done so that you are aware and you are prepared before you start the surgery absolutely i fully agree with you and that particular patient was referred uh, by another ophthalmologist and we did ultrasound b scan everything exactly yeah that, but uh, that would help us for the pct uh, x-ray we didn't do yes Right. But anyway, we anticipated that something will be there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. So Why? we have Dr. Sandeep Gupta uh, speaking on uh, cataract surgery with corneal trauma. This is out of the books because he was not aware from the AIS. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, OTSI as well as uh, AIC for giving me this opportunity. Most of us deal with uh, cataract and trauma, but uh, we should always remember whenever we have trauma, different kind of trauma will lead to different problems. So if you have penetrating trauma, there is a risk you have a retained foreign body as shown in this case. Or blunt traumas uh, are complicated by edema and glaucoma, we should be aware of these things. Now presentations can be varied, you have a trauma with lens matter in AC, you have uh, only rupture, you can have PC rupture also, you can have nucleus drop, you can have just a peripheral limbal perforation with a cortical cataract and sometimes you just have a micro perf and nothing else and sometimes this is the most common presentations we have the referred cases with repaired perf with retained lens matters now few things are important when to time the cataract surgery this question was just raised how do we modify the steps what intra problems we face during surgeries and how do we rehabilitate these patients now primary corneal repair please remember for all the residents and uh, beginners is a priority globe integrity is of paramount importance and in trauma we have edema we have uveitis IL power calculation is difficult so most of us except for the uh, most of us we go for a primary corneal repair only now this is one case we have a capsular breach cortical matter is in AC there is an endothelial touch here we can do primary repair with cataract surgery and in this case since uh, lens matter one is, was in AC <coughs> we had to go in we had to convert this case and uh, we had to do AC wash convert the capsular uh, frill into a uh, rexis and in second stage we went ahead and put in an IU. Now delayed cataract surgery is always better because cornea becomes clearer, inflammation is less, capsule is fibrous, it holds the IUL better. It, it is usually done after suture removal when IL power, power calculation becomes better. Please remember in children in trauma, wound stabilizes early, there is a risk of amblyopia. So we can do the second secondary surgery little early. Now this is again one thing you should remember, tunnel incisions do not self heal in children. And we should go ahead with superior, <laughs> it's going on its own. Yeah. Videos are playing on, on their own. So depending on where you have space, you should modify the wound. So in this case, if we uh, do a superior incision, the surgery would have been difficult. That is why we went ahead and did a temporal approach. Since uh, temporal approach gives us more, more area, more clear area for doing phaco emulsification. Another thing we remember during making of wounds that uh, superior approach in children is always better. It uh, protects the wounds in children and you should always suture uh, wounds in children. Now, how to handle synechia? This is a very common thing. So please remember, you after removing the uh, sutures, never try to peel off the anterior synechia because if you start peeling off the synechia, especially anterior, you start getting multiple DMDs which become very very difficult to handle. So in this case it is always better to cut the anterior synechia and after cutting the anterior synechia then you should you can remove the posterior synechia and after that you can always make an opening and put in a uh, IUL if required in the same sitting or in the second sitting. This is a case where we had probably planned maybe we'll do a PK later on so after putting in IUL in the second stage we went ahead and did a PK in this case. BR instruments are very very handy. You use bimanual forceps as well as uh, bimanual uh, scissors. They are very very helpful in such scenarios. So in this case as I said we did a PK in a second sitting. Now how to do capsule access in cases where you have corneal uh, opacities. Always stain the capsule. Use retroillumination and look for capsular tear and try and make it into uh, a capsular rexus. Try to have an eccentric rexus. Uh, use forceps and if possible uh, make a larger rexus. In this case you try and make a eccentric rexus in a, in, in a place where the cornea is clearer so that you can do a phaco emulsification easily. 
and in this case the temporal or the inferior area was little better we went ahead and did a temporal or a larger excess now again if required you can use hooks in this stage also to finish the surgery so hooks helped us uh, finish the surgery better in this case because the caps uh, iris had become smaller in this case and just using a single hook i was able to finish off this surgery now this is again one thing which uh, dr rajan also showed now sometimes we have a situation like this where we are not sure about the zonal integrity in this case you can go ahead and make a smaller excess the synecke itself will give you support the capsular support will be very good with the synecke also so since it was a soft cataract a small excess was very comfortable we were able to finish off the surgery and then after putting a iwl the excess was extended but the synecke was left in c2 so that they were giving support and no extra device was required in this case now this is again one case where we had a corneal trauma it was a repaired perf and there was poor uh, capsular support however this was a young patient and uh, if you see uh, now the choice was uh, whether we go ahead with the surgery or we wait and uh, do a sfil so either way since it was a young patient rest of the you assume the rest of the synecke are very good and support is very uh, good so always stay in such capsules and whenever you come to the fibrotic area use the uh, forceps so in this case i'm using ilm peeling forceps to finish off the capsular excess now again in this case always do eccentric excess uh, because once you put in a ctr the capsule will be the whole uh, back will shift to another side so if you see the excess is eccentric and uh, i am able to uh, finish off the excess easily now hooks were placed little away because this here the cornea was compromised the cornea and the limbal area was very very thin so after i put uh, ctr a little late after finishing the surgery i was i put in the uh, ctr here at this stage and if you see once the ctr is put the whole back shifts to another side so a large eccentric excess helps in such a scenario and now you can put in the iwl and finish off the surgery very well in this case also so again when you do a phaco in such a case uh, try and make a clear area here we were able to uh, peel off the posterior synecke and uh, using bimanual instruments use iris hooks to make space so in this case again iris hooks were used to make space and then surgery we were able to finish off this uh, difficult looking surgery Uh, by just using iris hooks and the end result was very gratifying in this case also so ia by manual ia always help it is always better you have more control and better if the visibility is low then uh, when to tile uh, time the iul primary versus delayed it's a very very touchy topic uh, it is better to implant iul in secondary setting as it is better but you have better chances of placing iul in the back uh, you get better il par calculations capsule becomes fibrosed and there is less post op uveitis if you do a secondary ile implantation rather than trying it in the first stage itself with the uh, corneal surgery so where should you place if possible in the back in this case again uh, again a very tricky uh, kind of case where we didn't know what to do whether to go for sfil but uh, what we did was we just clean the area and uh, we made space and we were able to put a iul in the sulcus in this case also so in this case if we see the second uh, sfl uh, the secondary ile was put in the sulcus in this case and we were able to finish, finish off the surgery very well so in cases of poor capsular support you can do sfil or uh, suture fixated ile uh, to give rehabilitation to these cases uh, but remember most of these patients will have severe ac reactions you need to have long term steroid cycloplegics and the risk of post op cme is always high and again contact lenses in lot of these scenarios <laughs> Uh, uh to rehabilitate these patients so i'll just go ahead and finish off when to time the cataract surgery is uh, very important primary globe integrity is the most important thing pre op evaluation is very important you have to modify steps depending on the situation sutures the wounds and have a meticulous post op follow up especially for children because they can land up in amlyo thank you so much uh, uh thank you very much sandeep and now i will call upon dr purendra who is going to speak to us on the do's and don'ts of corneal scleral laceration dr prendra is from gwalior excellent uh, anterior segment surgeon so prendra thank you professor lahane sir and um, i am really humbled to be in the part of this uh, national instruction course on ocular trauma 
डूज एंड डोंट्स ऑफ कॉर्नल स्क्लेरल लेसरेशन आई हैव नो फाइनेंशियल इंटरेस्ट द सर्जिकल कोल्स ऑफ एनी कॉर्नियल लेसरेशन इज वाटर टाइट वून क्लोजर रिस्टोरेशन ऑफ नॉर्मल एनाटोमिकल रिलेशनशिप रिस्टोरेशन ऑफ ऑप्टिमल विजुअल फंक्शन प्रिवेंशन ऑफ पॉसिबल फ्यूचर कॉम्प्लिकेशंस सो इन ए कॉर्नियल स्क्लेरल लेसरेशन दैट कुड बी पार्शियल थिकनेस और अ फुल थिकनेस partial thickness we can do it with a pressure patch or bandage contact lens or if it is large then we put we can put few corneal suture if it is full thickness then a bandage contact lens self sealing the tissue adhesive simple laceration corneal suturing uvl incarceration reposition lens involvement do lensectomy vitreous involvement do vitrectomy scleral involvement do scleral suturing tissue loss patch graft or pkp and in case of irreparable uh, full thickness corneal scleral laceration uh, involving macula and optic nerve enucleation may be in the secondary setting corneal scleral closure our first incis uh, first uh, we should use a tano nylon so non absorbable suture and the first suture should be at the limbus then at the angle and uh, lastly then uh, at the end we go for the scleral suturing limbus is approximated first the most posterior portion of the inaccessible scleral laceration may at times be left unsutured and our suture bite towards the corneal center should be smaller than when we are to the periphery because this maintains the asphericity of the cornea a stellate corneal laceration can be uh, sutured by bridging sutures and as you can see here in the center or a pearl string suture or a multiple interrupted sutures and tissue adhesive or a patch graft tissue adhesive and bandage contact lens are very helpful in all these cases uh, in a case of prolapsed uvl tissue we should cut all the tissue when it is more than 24 hours old and uh, if it is macerated then we can cut it early or infected or devitalized then even at 6 hours we can cut we should cut it <coughs> and uh, maintain the ch anterior chamber with the help of visco elastic or the air bubble while placing the sutures and a uh, entry through the paracentesis wound is very very helpful and useful and uh, iris repair if it is large enough should be done at a second stage this is a interesting case with the uh, uh, uvl tissue incarcerated in the full thickness um, corneal laceration and uh, through the paracentesis wound we are releasing all the additions if it is not possible to be released uh, in a first go you can use the uh, you can enter through the wound itself and a first suture as i said sh should be large and in 90% thickness of the cornea and it should be tight enough should be at the limbus and uh, three knots are given uh, then it we should fill go for the uh, delimited the uh, suture uh, the the wound and the next suture should be towards the other end of this and throughout the chamber should be filled with uh, air bubble or visco elastic we are doing a non touch technique we are not holding the edges of the um, wound in most of our cases uh, as far as possible unless in a wide open wide mouth uh, um, the wound large wounds then make it half and uh, then fill the sutures in between the sutures should be perpendicular to the direction of the wound they may appear to be regular as you can see now but they are perpendicular to the main uh, line of the in, uh, the wound and remove the visco elastic at the end mind it our lens should not be damaged during our entire surgical procedure this is a corneal scleral wound and uh, uvl tissue is there in the uh, limbus area as you can see and uh, we cannot go through the side port because it's a large wound uh, at this moment uh, first we place a large suture long suture at the limbus after repositing the uvl tissue and uvl tissue should not be in the bite of our uh, suture and that should be maintained and the suture not should always be buried at the end of the surgery and uh, this is a uh, limbus to limbus and rather it is extended into the sclera after the putting the corneal suture the scleral wound is repaired this is large uvl cornea uh, tear limbus parallel 
UL tissue is a uh, fresh case, we can deposit it inside because the presence of UVL tissue is uh, very, very helpful to uh, avoid glare in the post-operative period and a patient will, the quality of vision is better if the UVL curtain is there. So, uh, the same principle, first uh, the two ends, then the angle and then fill the sutures in between. Now, we will place another suture in the angle and uh, remove the wash the anterior chamber with the from with the uh, BSS at the end and fill keep the chamber filled throughout with the um, air or viscoelastic because it's a large wound and uh, <coughs> this is a corneal scleral tear large uvl prolapse with the uh, presence of long uh, the exudates uh, on the surface and uh, we are not cutting the uvl tissue it is the exudative membrane which has been released to decrease the load of the uveitis in the post operative period there is a large gaping and uh, we have to be very very careful in putting suture sometimes uh, because while tightening the suture can uh, break so we can use uh, uh, the vicryl suture which has got uh, 8 or 90 vicryl suture and uh, th then to because that has a better strength after the corneal part is sutured we are now suturing the uveal tissue uh, sorry scleral area and scleral area is sutured uh, like a zipper we we go one by one and don't expose uh, or uh, expose the tear by uh, cutting the conjunctiva over it uh, in the full length of the scleral tear because that is going to pull up of the blood and pulling of the blood and go one by one like a zipper as we are doing here and we may uh, our use uh, assistant should be good enough to remove all the blood clot over there and as we were discussing uh, in the past uh, when to do a cataract surgery so like in this particular case uh, this is a non-touch technique uh, of placing the suture in this particular case there is a flocculent lens matter and the traumatic cataract is there and uh, we are doing a rouse hose te Hayes technique and when the central sutures towards the uh, corneal central is uh, smaller and towards the periphery they are larger this results in a uh, flattened peripheral cornea and after that we do uh, anterior capsulotomy <coughs> and uh, do uh, the bimanual irrigation aspiration of the loose lens matter the young case and um, the anterior capsule is cut on either side and uh, so that um, it doesn't obstruct the visual acuity and the, this was a six years old child so we did a primary posterior capsulotomy also and a three piece IOL is suggested in all these cases instead of a single piece IOL and uh, even if you are placing in the uh, bag still you should maintain uh, use a three piece IOL this is the, uh, the ovalization of the posterior capsule and uh, optic capture is done in the end so do's in the early stage of when you see a cornea scleral laceration an open globe injury requires urgent medical attention to prevent further damage to the eye and preserve the vision cover the injured eye with a clean and sterile gauze shield to prevent any further damage or infection keep the injured person calm and still to prevent further damage to the eye give a pain relief medication use preservative free antibiotic drops I always avoid ointment in the initial uh, examination. We always teach our PGs and DNB students for this. And avoid pressure on the injured eyeball as it can cause further damage. Use lignocaine proparacaine eye drops for the examination of such case. Leave any foreign body uh, that may have caused the injury in place. Remove them in an appropriate sterile setting and with the sterile instruments. An open globe injury requires immediate medical attention, so don't delay seeking treatment and it should be done by the senior person. The take home message is every case should be independently assessed, but in general, corneal or corneal scleral tear repair to be done early. Remove loose lens matter, foreign body hemorrhage, exudates in the anterior chamber. In case of suspicion of infection, irrigate anterior chamber with antibiotic, give intravitreal injection vancomycin septazidine or with or without voriconazole post primary tear repair manage arthritis glaucoma infection or and the corneal surface a secondary iron implantation is a good alternative 
in penetrating trauma leading to better visual out and surgical result as has been propagated in various uh, clinical studies. I thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Parinder, for a lovely message. We can have Dr. Kurej Muskati on the other side. Uh, I think just a couple of uh, messages for the younger people. Uh, what he mentioned was that when we are suturing the cornea, I think it's very important to suture the limbus first and to maintain the integrity and the anatomy of the cornea. I think we should never forget that. Even if it's a corneoscleral tear, try to uh, uh, put the suture on the limbus first. If not possible, it's giving it. Then you get the scleral uh, position much better and get the limbus close to each other. And second comment is, yes, he has shown lovely interrupted sutures, but a lot of surgeons, senior people, if it's a straight cut, you can go ahead with the uh, continuous sutures also if you are comfortable uh, with it. Well, it depends, I'm to say. I, right, so, right, yeah. Uh, we have Dr. Karesh Moskati, and he'll be speaking on acute chemical injury management protocols. Can we have the next? Oh, okay, fine. Thanks. A uh, few take home messages uh, on the acute chemical injuries. So, we know of Dua's classification. I take it as red that you know of Dua's, which has replaced the, the previous Thoff classification and others. It varies from very good to poor, one to six. And uh, we know now we have the concept of limbal stem cells. So, we look closely at the limbus. Just one message. When you're classifying, make notes and write down what it is in Dua's classification. And every day, two days, whenever you see the patient, it's dynamic. It can change. So, it can go from 3 to 2. It can go from 4 to 2. It can go from 2 to 4. So, it's not a one-time classification. We need to uh, change it as, as required because it will affect the prognosis. So, emergency treatment, we know. Just a point on what is copious lavage. Uh, if if you've got uh, the uh, hospital set up or you've got people to do this for you, please tell them to do it for at least a couple of hours. Copious lavage doesn't mean five-minute wash with 10 cc syringe. It means one bottle or two bottles of ringers to be used. Uh, if early reportage, you can do a paracentesis. If it's a Lyme injury, Chuna injury, then you must make sure you remove all the Lyme. If it's a cooperative patient, you can remove it fine. Otherwise, take up the patient under GA and remove it. And there's no sense in leaving any necrotic material behind. It's dead material. So the earlier you remove it, the better. The importance of 10%, the other things are well known. I'm not stressing on it for time. But 10% ascorbate. Many times I'm asked how to prepare vitamin C drops. There is nothing to prepare. You just need an empty sterile bottle. So take a bottle of tears, empty the contents, break an ampule of vitamin C, which is 500 milligram in 5 cc. Requires nothing except a nice sharp, a blow to the ampoule, break it, pour it into the, the empty bottle that you have and dispense. If you don't have injection vitamin C available, you get tablet vitamin C, which is 500 milligram, dissolve it in 5 ml of ringers or whatever and do the same thing. That's again 10%. So it is idiot proof how to make this and it's extremely important that everyone uses this for any uh, chemical burn. I will also talk about a little bit about subconjunctival blood and it's important. So, two ways in which blood is used. The, the One is you inject it into the fornices. Take blood from the elbow, uh, venous blood, and one cc at night. You, you inject it into the fornices and then put drops of that blood onto the cornea drop by drop. It will spill over. But at some point, a clot will form. Then gently pull the upper lid over the clot so that the clot is kept in place at night. And next morning, you can again, you can remove the patch and the patient can blink. Uh, again, uh, 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 unnecessary uh, drama is created about steroids. Steroid is a big yes in uh, early chemical burns. There are only very few times when you are suspecting infections that you will not use steroid. Remember, steroid reduces inflammation. It does not do anything to epithelial migration. So, if, if there is an epithelial defect, the epithelium will still grow in presence of steroid. Sheffer saying and Kenyon's landmark paper in the 80s. So, it suppresses inflammation, which is very important. So, subconjunctival venous blood, formation of blood clot on the cornea, these are important things. Uh, another landmark paper I want to allude to is the paper by the late uh, uh, Dr. M. H. Sridhar and Dr. Rao and Sangwan et al., which is almost 25 years old now, which proved that you 
can and you must use amniotic membrane in the early phases. We are all knowing know that when symbolephora occur, you put this, but in the early stages, it reduces the inflammation considerably. It has a huge anti-inflammatory role. It may get absorbed in a week. It may get absorbed in two weeks, depending on the amount of inflammation which is there. But it has tamped down the inflammation, which is very necessary. You can even repeat the amniotic membrane. Supportive treatment is, is uh, uh, standard. Again, I would give oral vitamin C by mouth for these patients. Now to tell you why I am stressing so much on vitamin C, it reduces the incidence of ulcers and perforations. It is required by fibroblasts to make collagen. You want the building blocks to come in early, so it's required. And it's been proved that uh, in, the, in the anterior chamber of a chemical burn victim, there is almost zero vitamin C left. Why blood? It dilutes the uh, chemical, it uh, separates the tissues, it acts as a barrier against penetration, and it's fibrinolytic, it prevents simblephron. So again, it's something which is homemade, which is cheap, and uh, uh, accessible to everyone, no matter how rural your setting is. And it, it is a huge um, uh, role to play. Again, in the Brighton Con Cornea Congress, in the European Congress in 1980, it, was, it came out. Since that time, I have been using the last 40 years now, uh, it contains anti-proteases which inhibits collagenase. So collagenase is the bad guy who is trying to break down the newly formed collagen which your vitamin C is helping to form. So if you got this anti-proteases, it bashes up the bad guy, the collagenase, and so allows collagen to remain there. And the platelets in the blood fill up the gaps in the denuded surface. So the breaks which are there are all filled up with collagen, with platelets. The platelets also adhere. Platelets are normally cuboidal. If you've seen the oval-shaped platelets, no longer. When you put it over there, they become like amoeba. They grow pseudopods. And they hold on to the collagen as if it is hero holding on to heroin and prevent that collagen from breaking down. So huge uh, 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 role to play of a simple, cheap substance. And I urge everyone to use the blood. Again, doxycycline is something which is my favorite. It reduces melts. You can use tetracyclines. You can use azithromycin. Doxy is cheap, easily available. And another new thing is tenoplasty. Whenever you got ischemia, uh, to put tenons to fill up those gaps, it doesn't look very nice, but it works very well. Papers coming out from Iran, an uh, unlikely place like that, especially during COVID times when we were using oxygen. We are all now used to the concept of oxygen. Using a simple oxygen mask can work wonders just twice a day. Look at this paper which says oxygen therapy for acute chemical, again something which is cheap and is available to us and it has a dramatic effect when it when they did 24 eyes with grade 3 to 4 burns, the corneal epithelial defects heal faster than the oxygen group, 15 days healing versus 60 days. So again, something cheap and something which we can use, increased corneal transparency, decreased corneal vascularization, better visual equity. How is it given? 100% oxygen, simple mask, flow rate of 10 liters per minute. Again, if you're in a hospital setup, every hospital has got oxygen. Every hospital has a mask. Use it, otherwise admit the patient in the nearest general hospital and, and uh, do this. So again, this has been around since almost over a decade. So to, su to summarize, uh, uh, um, three things. Use of topical vitamin C, cheap, easy, easy to make and dispense. Use of the patient's own venous blood, both as subcongenital blood and as clots at night. This subcongenital blood can be repeated every two to three days when you find that there is that the eye is not looking angry, bloody red. Just inject again; it's cheap. And the third thing is the use of oxygen um, in a hospital setting. Just 10 liters per minute, twice a day, is sufficient, and you will really dramatically improve your prognosis in patients with acute chemical burns. Thank I you, thank sir. Thank you so much. And I am apologize if I've overrated your brain. No, no, no. At all, sir. I think it was an eye opener and beautiful talk, sir. And one question, sir. Uh, you give doxycycline for how many days? Uh, any particular regime? At you least, have? at least two months. At, at least two at months. Least two months yeah. In spite the cornea has healed up. Yeah, it's and just it, it prevents. What is happening is there is a lot of activity going on under that surface, which looks healed. Collagenase is working. Collagen is being broken down. So this doxycycline also works as an anti Right. And one thing he mentioned was a copious irrigation. I think that is the, the most important. And second thing he said, don't be afraid of the steroids. I think that's the 
yeah. also take up these if it's a child i almost always will take the patient up under ga as soon as the anesthetist gives me fitness because those chuna particles are so deep in the fornix i have had children 3 months and 6 months after a chuna injury coming to me i do ga and there is chuna there how could the child heal if there is chuna constantly reaching into the eye yeah thank you dr uh, ramesh The, the critical period is the first few days, which is when the steroid is most required. Most people do it after two, three weeks. Then they will start the patient on steroid. When it is of homeopathy, it doesn't really help. So the second important factor you have spoken is the plasma. I think we can add up the plasma dose for subsequent fifteen days. It's yeah, so going to help blood, us. Yeah, blood is faster available. You can yeah. Take, if you have facilities, you can have plasma rich yeah. serum. So you just exactly you serum. You dilute the serum twenty percent. You give it in a five ml bottle and yes. you can use it. If, it helps in healing. If you have I bank, then that plasma will be there. So next we have so, Dr. Lane to speak on cataract management in the traumatic eye. uh thank you the chairman co chairman and convener and my all friends sitting down and this is a you know i am working in the government medical college mumbai and near about every day the frequency of the traumatic uh, cases coming is minimum 4 every day 365 days and normally on sunday 5 so that is what is the frequency and we do near about 450 uh, th th this uh, therapy th this apna uh, pkps in this cases uh, we do the uh, therapeutic keratoplasty more than 450 uh, maximum not we are doing less tkp than the this apna less pkp than the tkp it is a uh, so much number is there and patients are coming so i am just going to speak on my topic that is a management of uh, in the traumatic eye so this is uh, important thing is the counseling and the consent see whenever the patients are coming the relatives are in agony so here you will have to tell them very properly what is the prognosis of the patient and you will have to also give the guarded prognosis in every situation you are not knowing what is there behind the making the patient and specially relatives calm down and normally the female relatives very difficult to calm down them so you have to calm down them and uh, if those are the literate people then again it is very difficult to convince them okay so then they go from one hospital to other hospital and lastly they come to jj uh, need to multiple surgeries not one day two day but maybe for the, you can say for one to three months multiple surgery and another is a medical legal see you will have to go for the apr up each and every traumatic case so that we uh, we are saved in that now whenever the uh, pre operative workup is very important and you should not make an hurry like an, the parents are like that so proper evaluation the breach in the anterior capsule depth of the anterior chamber zonular integrity should be uh, uh, investigated and then you can see this type of cases of the cataract come to us and see now every case is different and when these cases come to you then you will have to uh, cataract with the pleural tear here you can go for the repair first and once you make then you remove the incarcerated lens there which is there and the post suture remover and the ac is quiet then only plan the cataract you should not plan the cataract uh, with, at the beginning so that uh, that will cause the problems then the cataract with aerodialysis uh, see aerodialysis repair and then in the same sitting you can go for the growth up aap aa sakte ho then the uh, anterior uh, this uh, anterior capsular rupture maximum cases you will have the capsular rupture and uh, rexis is challenging now the those who are having the femto they can use femto but you know the femto is all over india it is not more than i uh, can say 200 or like that so and the uptan lages are 25000 so it is not possible to go with femto but yes that definitely helps 
uh, soft cataract all cataracts are normally soft you should aspirate and always remember no no trifocal lens in these cases because we are giving trifocal lens for each and every patient that should not happen now this is the case the you can see the after the sinic eyes are formed and everything the fibrosis is there then the patient is taken for the cataract surgery and you must stain the cataract you have seen there is a rupture of the anterior capsule there, there are sinic eyes all over so primarily just break this break all the sinic eyes and after breaking the sinic eyes now the rexis you can do it only the half part of the rexis so because another half part is made by the trauma so this is the foreshape with that i am making the rexis and in other places you can see there is a membrane also on that so i am taking that membrane also with me see here the membrane and then the i am completing the partial rexis uh, in the remaining capsule so this can give you the bag and once the bag is there then you can just aspirate the uh, see this uh, lens because it is a soft cataract so you can aspirate and you can see there is a tissue also so once you aspirate it then you can implant the lens the lens is implanted in the bag now you will ask me about the tissue are you going to do the pccc primarily always don't do it if the patient is uh, more than 10 12 years of age you can go for the yag lat round because you will have to see the uh, how it heals and the reaction so wait for that so cataract with the zonular dehiscence you can see uh, it is a back stabilization and then you can aspirate so you have just seen this is the uh, cataract and the another cataract i will show you this is a, uh, a superior uh, zonular dehiscence for o'clock hours then you can go for the ctr then if it is a inferior three o'clock hours you can go to the ctr with ivl implantation uh, then the three to six o, more than three to six o'clock you can go for the modified ctr with single loop and if it is six to nine o'clock hours then you can go for modified ctr with double loop with ivl implantation and if it is more than nine o'clock hours then they say pivl hour iris fixated ivl you can do it so this is the capsular axis i am doing in a case of you can see this is the i am not having the femto so i am doing with the manually the rexis and whenever i am doing the rexis see here so it should be a small rexis so larger rexis is not possible as you have seen so much uh, and then you go for the ctr and see here now i am just putting the inserting the ctr in and after that also because you have seen the it is a more than you can say 6 o'clock hours the uh, subluxation is there so it is very difficult this only one ring will not support and then the i will implantation you can do inside can rotate now other cataract is an white subluxated cataract you can see this and again you can do the rexis see here the ctr when the rexis is small then the lens will not come out so what i am doing here is as the lens is very hard and i am doing a small incision so here i am making the two pieces of the lens making the feco chap and after the feco chap i will just remove these lenses out by the sics now if there is a detachment then 
multiple approaches you can have anterior segment and also the we are if you are in the institute and the conclusion is preoperative counseling is the most important part of the preoperative workup decision and timing of ctr cts in selection is crucial combined approach and proper utilization of all surgical weapons in your armatum is more important when doubt better to convert case into the secondary iwl or sf iwl or iris claw thank you very much thank you dr lane for a wonderful presentation any questions or comments by the time prashant is getting ready excellent sir you covered everything about traumatic cataract and also combined injuries and a multidisciplinary approach yes and also exactly and i also add uh, in the consent about sympathetic ophthalmia even though it's one out of uh, one lakh i still write in the consent form that there is a risk of sympathetic ophthalmia so you have to keep a watch on the other eye which very rare but yes prashant ready yeah i'm ready <coughs> yes prashant prashant yeah, thank you on traumatic uh, vitreous hemorrhage thank you i would be speaking on traumatic vitreous hemorrhage well from a uh, vitreous hemorrhage it is uh, trauma is the second single most common cause of vitreous hemorrhage and leading cause of vitreous hemorrhage in younger patients especially so in males well when you have a case of a vitreous hemorrhage don't be in a rush to operate you should always assess the history as usual in any cases of trauma you have to take a past history whether it is associated with classes previous trauma medical histories also you should always give, think about if it's a open globe injury whether it is if he has presented to you acutely whether he has received titanotoxic toxicity the nature of injury whether he wore a eye wear protection whether there was any evidence of foreign body type of a foreign body will all influence the type of a decision which you are going to take in this particular cases so first foremost thing is the proper assessment it should be detailed and thorough you should follow a standard sequence in all cases of trauma and always in a case of trauma look beyond what is obvious so this is what we may, uh, at our place we follow the first foremost thing is to take a visual acuity it is because initial visual acuity is prognostic uh, prog have a prognostic uh, value whenever you are assessing and visual acuity in a case of a vitreous hemorrhage if i go by it depends upon the location and density of him if the hemorrhage is predominantly located inferiorly you might have a good vision but there might be a detachment beneath it so you need to look beyond the obvious and that's what it means so visual acuity 66 does not necessarily exclude serious eye complications evaluate pupils because behind a vitreous hemorrhage if there is a trauma to the optic now the poor patient is not going to gain and accordingly you have to prognosticate a patient external examination you should look for signs like canopthalma or retrobulbar hemorrhage that will tell you about the severity of injury and the comorbidity ocular comorbidity which needs to be reassessed palpet for crepitus and bony deformity and whenever you are in doubt please do explore the patient ocular movements all this has become an integral part of evaluation whenever you are evaluating a case of a trauma slit lamp examination should be done because it can give a clue about the type of injury many a times you might have a apparent blunt injury look carefully you might see a sealed cornea perforation you might see a iridodialysis which will influence the type of a decision which you are going to do now regarding intraocular pressures you can have a low as well as a high intraocular pressure most importantly remember high iup does not exclude possibility of an rupture so whenever you are seeing a vitreous hemorrhage this are important thing because if there is a rupture associated you need to repair that before you tackle a vitreous hemorrhage gonioscopy yes where well, that, that will help you in prognosticating and most importantly try to see with the help of an indirect ophthalmoscope what lies beneath the vitreous hemorrhage and what many a times you might see a dialysis you might see a subluxated cataract a white without pressure some horseshoe tear some some sacroidal tear which investigations well you are, these are the type of investigations i would not run through this but b scan is work, one of the most important investigation when you are planning a management of a vitreous hemorrhage because it tells you about the vitreo retinal interrelation importantly if you do if you are doing a conservative management serial b scans are must because the vitreo retinal interface is a dynamic thing 
as the vitreous starts contracting you might have a tear which was not evidenced or which was not noticed on the first b scan and so these are all the things which you need to do, look for also b scan can give you additional information in where you are not seeing you might see a sign of a rupture in the form of a large posterior square a collapsed globe a choroidals when do you do such costly investigations is whenever you are suspecting a scleral rupture uh, and you are not able to visualize it beneath the vitreous hemorrhages you can get additional findings with it and many a times you can be you would be surprised that even in a history is given of a blunt injury but you pick up a foreign body in such cases octs can pick up the traumas well if the patient denies perception of light visually potential should be done and if vp is positive definitely you should be giving a so, uh, all the benefit of surgery to the patient most important for the postgraduate sitting here always assess the uninvolved eye for unrecognized injuries medical legal aspects sympathetic ophthalmia and injury might be incidental to pre-existing vitreo retinopathy it means he might have an eels disease in both the eyes and the hemorrhage is just secondary to a uh, eels disease not to the trauma which might be an incidental thing so these are the anti-segment and the post-segment associated comorbidities which should be assessed before you prognosticate this particular patient. So how do you go ahead in a case of a vitreous hemorrhage? Well, many a times the older teaching was whenever you have a vitreous hemorrhage, wait for three to six months. In this era of minimally invasive vitreous surgery, we do not wait as a vitreous retinal surgeon more than three to four weeks, especially when you have done a B scan and retina is attached. If the retina is attached, you can afford to wait. But in the setting of a trauma, vitreous hemorrhage is there. You need to do serial B scans up at every seven days gap. And if you see there is a development of a tear or a detachment, you have to just go for an internal surgery. So these are the factors how we decide about what to do. But sometimes you see a hemorrhage which is minimal in nature. You feel that you might be able to avoid through the surgery a vitreous procedure, then do serial B scans as I said. If you see a hemorrhage, something like this, subhaloid hemorrhage, well, NDR laser, um, uh, you can use to dis disturb. But remember, if it is a small proportion, the hemorrhage might body might be able to absorb. But if it is in a large proportion, especially in a young child in an amblyopic age, that will deprive him of a vision. In that case, uh, halodotomy is not the way. Behind, beneath the hemorrhage, many a times, it is not necessary a retinal vessel avulsion. There might be retinal tears which needs to be picked up by doing a proper indirect ophthalmoscopy and they have to be adequately treated either with a cryotherapy or a laser. If the visualization is good, do a laser indirect ophthalmoscopy and if it is not that good, you can use a cryo. But this should be repeated. In spite of doing a laser, you should be repeating the serial indirect ophthalmoscope every one week for development of new breaks. When do you do vitrectomy whenever there is a vitreous hemorrhage which is non-absorbing or if it is associated with foreign body and ophthalmitis or with a, uh, you know, ruptures and all that is the time when you directly go for vitrectomy. So how do you time? In a blunt trauma, there is no return and detachment. You do prefer to do it as a planned procedure. But if there is a detachment, you should go early. In a setting of perforating, it is always prudent to go early preferably as a primary procedure if the visual access is clear. These are the advantages of taking the patient early versus late. Usually the second surgery, especially in the context of a perforating injury where you have done a repair, should be done in a golden period of 7 to 10 days. Previously it was said as 10 to 14 days, but that's what my slide shows. But 7 to 10 days if the visual access permits, it will be ideal to do as a vitreous surgery. So what are the goals of vitrectomy? You clear the media, you relieve the traction, you reattach the retina. If there is a foreign body, you treat and treat all the breaks. These are the prognostic factors which can affect the prognosis. Now let's move on to a few of the cases. This is a case of a trauma, a blunt trauma where the corneal wound which was done initially, uh, some corneal phaco surgery has been done, reopens on a blunt trauma and here First foremost thing is we are going to do a primary repair of the wound which has opened and now you can see in this particular case the visual access is clear. So I am going to go ahead with the vitreous surgery in the same setting. So after a proper thing if you get a good watertight wound you are going to go ahead with the vitreous surgery in the same setting and in this particular case you should have done a B scan and this is what you see there is a vitreous hemorrhage. This is a relatively easy case where you do not have much of this 
just the hemorrhage which has moved behind you should do a good indirect ophthalmoscopy and if there are any breaks or anything you need to tackle them. Now this is a case of a trauma with a vitreous hemorrhage and here is a nail which is lying there in the eyes of a patient for last 48 hours. Do you need to do any investigations for this? I don't think so. You directly need to take this patient for a surgery. The primary concern in this patient should be to first is to remove the nail and do a repair of this particular patient. You trust me, this is two inches nail which was impacted into the posterior layer. So as a primary procedure, you do that. You repair the anterior segment with a wound. Do vitreous uh, wound uh, toileting of the uh, wound properly. Remove the vitreous and the iris tissue which was impacted. Explore the lateral extent of the wound. That is most important in this case. So if you see, once I dissect this, I realize there is an extension. Though the foreign body was looking only 2 mm in weight, it had extended. There was a scleral tear which was extending much beyond that. So I repaired that. And as a secondary procedure, we do vitrectomy. And then you can see beneath the vitreous hemorrhage, there is a second point of impact which was also tackled. We did a vitrectomy, we did an endolaser, we cut the fibrous tissue which has started in growth, which has started growing in. Yes, sir, that's last video. And after I do a endolaser, a tamponade is being done. And this is a case with a foreign body. I will just run through. And you can see after having done a repair, again it was outside the visual axis. I, I was confident I would be able to do so. We are doing a lensectomy, vitrectomy. And here is a vitreous hemorrhage with a foreign body over here. You can see a metallic foreign body which is shining through. You have to be careful because of the moment it can cause further impacts and injury to the retina. And then by golden handshake technique, uh, it is I get it out through the anterior segment. Here is a magnet which is picking up the uh, thing. Now by a handshake technique, I will be using under viscoelastic a second instrument aligning it in a vertical meridian and it will be coming out. So this is a wooden vitreous hemorrhage with a hidden foreign body. I will just run through it. So remember, this are the way how we manage. But just finishing the surgery is not important. Equally important is to rehabilitate the patient, regular eye chips in spite of it. And important is beyond being a doctor, you should also help him in vocational rehabilitation. Thank you friends for this uh, patient hearing. Thank you, Prashant, for that extensive coverage of the subject very meticulously. Um, you have covered these aspects, but I would like you to reiterate them. How has your management changed in the, say, last decade or couple of decades for vitreous hemorrhage in a closed globe and vitreous hemorrhage in an open yeah, globe right. injury? Oh, evolution over the last couple of decades. Exactly. Yeah. So if I go cases, by... With... Cases which do not have an associated, let's say, um, foreign body or a cases that do not have a retinal detachment. So if I come by the blunt injury where I am not uh, seeing on a B scan and attached retina in older days when minimally invasive vitreous surgery was not there, we would wait for about at least two to three months for before touching him for a vitreous surgery. But now our patients, we do not have that big a threshold. We just, uh, we wait maximum two to three weeks where we get a fair uh, amount of idea whether how it is going to behave. And if I realize that it is going to, are you ready? Okay. Okay. So if I realize that hemorrhage is quite adequate, uh, means uh, more than the capacity of the body to help in a spontaneous absorption, I will go, not uh, means wait for vitrectomy. Now regarding in the context of a open globe injury, yes, previously we used to say, as I said in my slide, 10 to 14 days was the second window when we used to go for vitreous surgery. But we were waiting for a PVD to happen. Yeah, we believe that PVD will happen, the wound will have sealed, there will be no less leakage. But now, the classic thing is, as early as visual access permits. So, in this setting, now, if I get a wound, if I get a good visual access, I would go as early as four to five days. And preferably, I would like to do vitreous surgery in an open group context as early as seven to ten days latest, I should say. Because you're trying to prevent fibrovascular ingrowth. Yeah, fibrovascular. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is what we wanted to stress. Thank you. Call upon Dr. Natarajan yes, to yeah. speak yeah. to us on management of traumatic retinal detachment in open globe injuries. Thank you, Ashok, uh, for this. And a traumatic retinal.
So traumatic retinal detachment accounts for 10 to 40 percent of all retinal detachments. Rate of traumatic retinal detachment is at the level of 0.2 every 10,000 injuries. And there is no generally accepted definition of traumatic retinal detachment. Thus, the diagnosis is based on the particular history. And retinal detachment is seen up to 30 percent among all serious eye injuries. Has a poor prognosis for successful outcome. Retinal detachment may accompany both open and closed globe injuries, but is important. It is more prevalent after closed globe injury, about 70 to 85 percent. And retinal detachment has been reported to occur in up to 30 percent of open globe injuries and 6 to 36 percent of those with posterior segment intraocular foreign bodies. So, initial evaluation is very important. A detailed history, mechanism of injury, uh, velocity, and size of the object check visual acuity, note the presence or absence of an afferent pupillary defect, check IOP. All these are very important for medical legal purpose also. And a retinal examination, examination the back of the eye with an indirect ophthalmoscope. It provides a highly detailed view of your whole eye, allows the eye doctor to see any retinal holes or tears or detachment. And ultrasound imaging, use this test if bleeding has occurred, which Dr. Prashant mentioned, making it for you not to see the posterior segment. And we also have to do ancillary tests in the eye with no view, with retinal detachment, CT, MRI, electrophysiologic test, depending on what, what the situation is. So strategic thinking in ocular trauma is important. What is that? It's an individualized approach. Think again and again, what's the most suitable line of management for the given patient? And that's why I've written in my textbook, the surgical self-education, what you should know, what you're good at, and what you're planning for the next day. And it's like playing a soccer. You plan something and something else, always there's a surprise inside. Surgical repair is indicated as soon as the patient's circumstance allow it. The choice of surgery mainly depends on location of breaks, the amount of proliferative vitreal retinopathy and the surgeon's preference. And uh, in a trauma cases, there's a, a retinal detachment, there's an open globe injury and a retired intraocular form body. We have published this in the Journal of Ophthalmology with uh, Robert Radak, where they have a separate institute for ocular trauma. And my from my experience with traumatic retinal detachment cases, we have a 45-year-old male with a blurring of vision since 17 days, history of trauma with pulling band while doing exercise at home during this COVID time, and history of diagnosis with bullous retinal detachment with dense subretinal hemorrhage on 21st January, uh, and wound exploration and full thickness scleral repair was done elsewhere on 13th uh, January. And then this is what uh, is a danger which all of us have to know that uh, the whole thing which when he was pulling it came on the eye. And this is how the preoperative visual acuity was only a, a perception of light with a PR accurate in all quadrants with the intraocular pressure of nine. And we planned a pass pain me. And you will see this is the eye which was already uh, pre initial surgery was done elsewhere. And the patient came. You can uh, see the 25 gauge port have been placed. And there's a dense vitreous hemorrhage, which uh, we are doing the three port pass pain me to clear the vitreous hemorrhage and an eye with the vitreous hemorrhage and a retinal detachment with no PVD is really a, a tough uh, challenge for the vitreous surgeon. So you have to be patient. And uh, uh, we, me, myself and Ferenc Kuhn uh, from the International Society of Ocular Trauma decided that if you do a wound repair, the second surgery should be done within six days. That's about 100 hours of the first surgery. The reason is, I think by the time you have severe PVR, you can see that a patient came about two weeks later and you can see the terribly contracted retina. I had to do a 360-degree retinectomy and then uh, clear the subretinal hemorrhage and use uh, fluid air exchange and followed by air oil exchange. And then uh, this looks like a world map because of really a small amount of retina is uh, remaining. And you, I used the uh, intravitreal uh, uh, steroid injection at the conclusion for preventing further PVR. And this is a post-operative picture with an attached retina. And you still see some amount of PVR where we have to go back again and uh, do the surgery, either removing the oil or under the oil, and again support with more injection of silicon oil. This is a second case with a 624 vision with a retinal detachment. And you can see I planned a scleral buckling procedure. And uh, scleral buckling is a uh, is a fine art of uh, retinal surgery, even though it's a misnomer to reattach the retina. We work only on the sclera from outside. I tag the muscle. I use uh, uh, wh white switches for the vertical muscles and uh, black switcher for the horizontal muscle. The idea is so that, uh, uh, and also do a meticulous dissection so that 
following the scleral buckling surgery there is no squint or uh, entrapment of muscle and uh, uh, externally also the tenons covers the buccal well so that uh, you don't have buccal exposure and uh, buccal infection which may lead to uh, removal of the buccal later so this i measure the uh, make the uh, localization with the diathermy and then pass the uh, bob uh, where the suture for the scleral buckle you can also do a implant but uh, for only for the buckle i use the suture rest there's no sutures i'll you'll be seeing now i'll use the 240 band which will go behind the sutures behind the uh, muscle and then which goes uh, all around where i make a scleral flap using the hockey stick knife and which uh, goes all around and this is how the scleral flaps are made uh, like a belt loop and then pass the 240 band in the three quadrant where you don't uh, need the buckle so you have to be careful there is a risk of uh, perforation but i think uh, in an experienced hand uh, you hardly see any of those problems so you have to study the sclera uh, whether it's weak or uh, so that you avoid the place for the loop if uh, there's a problem then that place you can probably put a suture the idea of reducing the number of sutures is to uh, again sutures can attract uh, you know, some irritation and probably exposure of conjunctiva in the future so to avoid that you can use this so that there's no suture at all and uh, the 240 band is uh, tied using the Watsky's uh, silicon sleeve again no sutures so the where, where there is no need for a where, where vitreous surgery in an eye like this and particularly young patient where there's no PVD scleral buckling in a traumatic retinal detachment is uh, uh, works well or only thing is an open globe injury following the wound repair and then uh, you have to have a visualization and if you can't then you have to do vitrectomy for visualization and uh, induce PVD so which has its own uh, problem so you can see the I'm uh, at the bed of the uh, buckle I make a flap like a trabeculectomy flap I make a superficial scleral dissection to make sure that uh, uh, the full thickness sclera is not uh, open for the uh, set of drainage I make a flap and on the bed of the flap I make the using the hockey stick knife expose the choroid and do a drainage and I think the, the drainage you have to uh, this is how the uh, subretinal fluid is drained and uh, you can use the intraocular uh, uh, yeah, SF6 plus uh, air uh, non-expansive mixture to make sure that the intraocular pressure is maintained and also you don't have to uh, tighten the buckle so much so that the buckle height is enough and moderate so that you don't produce a, a eight layer appearance uh, to tighten the uh, buckle so i think we need a bu good uh, buckle height to support the retinal break and 240 band to support the 360 degree uh, so that you create a, a artificial pass plane so that the peripheral breaks are doesn't happen post operatively so usually you can get a 80 to 90 percent uh, success rate following a, a scleral buckling procedure and in case you have uh, recurrence then you can do a retinal surgery to re reattach the retina and most of the time if the surgery is time and done in time i think uh, the recovery is uh, uh, really good so both visually and uh, anatomically you can get 90 to 95 percent so here you see the buckle is trimmed after tightening it's a moderate tightening and then uh, there's no suture for conjunctiva i remove the uh, scleral sutures the and then use the uh, conjunctiva uh, glue for closing the conjunctiva and give a sub uh, conjunctival injection subtenal injection for uh, the to avoid uh, in infection following the placement of the buckle so here you put the make sure that stenon is not exposed and the entire sclera is covered with the uh, glue and now the this is a subcontinual injection so this is the uh, post operative picture with the 69 vision <coughs> and uh, maybe i'll just uh, this is again uh, another picture when i'll just go through it. and this is the last uh, case which i want to show where it's a corneal suture done and somebody said that it's a totally incarcerated retina with a giant tear and you see the back of the retina here like a morning glory flower and I open up the flap now and then uh, I did a 360 degree retinectomy using the chandelier illumination yeah, using so two forceps I'm separating the folds and then reattaching the retina using the perfluorocarbon liquid and I do a laser around the periphery 
which is like a world map, and then uh, use a uh, oil PFCL silicon oil exchange to uh, have the red map attached. So even an eye which looks like inoperable, you can do surgery to reattach the red map. So the main thing is never give up, and the only thing is in this uh, trauma, this is the only patient place where there is no PL eye you can operate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan, for a lovely talk. Of course, you are a great surgeon. There's no doubt about that. And handling these complicated. Now, we come to the last two talks on ophthalmoplasty. And we have Dr. J.K. Das, Controversies in Management of Orbital and uh, Optical Canal Fracture. And we have Dr. Akshay Nair as well. This would be our last stop, uh, thus. Yeah. No problem. Thank you, Akshay. Okay, I already make short my presentation. I just omit video, etc., because it's already discussed lots. So, just. Okay. So, that, uh, there is some controversies on uh, that is in a or management of orbital fracture as well as the optic. Uh, optic uh, the canal <clears throat> those controversies are either glue or not glue what type of material and what time <clears throat> we should go for intervention there is a some as per the standard book says so <clears throat> we can wait for 14 days uh, we can go for and we can for 7 to 14 days is the one of the best time and some says there may be more ischemia and ultimately there may be a residual diplopia in such scenario. But there is no controversy at all. One is an applied anatomy. This is the only one for any surgeon that is for before we touching, we should know thoroughly what are the things in applied anatomy. There is a no controversy on. Controversies are approaches. Generally, nowadays, we, everyone, we are very much comfortable with transconjunctival. We are not going for any other approach apart from the transconjunctival. Whatever, we will go for a transconjunctival. There is no controversy. But another big is issues are the transnasal. As mm, medical legal point of view, we are not too much tuned or we are not certified for doe and do nasal. So that's a, another big one. So <coughs> should I <coughs> should we prefer tense conjunctival or tense nasal? Tense conjunctival, <coughs> another another difficulty with the tense conjunctival is there is a more. One is previous trauma, second one is the our surgical trauma. We will induce surgical trauma little bit more on the orbit because it's a close one. Over that, in a tense nasal, there is advantage that we can approach it like a from the outside, like an air strike of thing. There is a biggest advantage with a tense nasal with the endoscope we can approach later. But visualization is one of the problem. Just like a war in between a, a, the ground stuff and the air strike. In the ground, we can details we can tackle, but in the air strike, it can pinpoint some target. But now it is era of the air strike, so we can, I think, go for a endonasal in some cases, especially in case if there's an optic canal is involved. So I am just uh, talking about the, some controversies about the incision. So that implant migration may be one of the cause. In such cases, should we go for up to the maximum extent of the injury or we restrict one or two mm ahead? That's another because to avoid buccal migration, once we reach the posterior extent, we should not go beyond. Otherwise, there may be a slippage. Of course, we can take care by that say, say glue or by a screw, but both are expensive and glue also is not easily available in all the areas sometimes. So limit of posterior extents. Anyway, we should not go beyond. So that's my point. So there is uh, some controversies regarding incision, just the anterior orbital I has already mentioned as we are running behind. <coughs> so uh, periosteal elevation. <laughs> so periosteal elevation that we can implant that 
or whatever the material so we can just say to protect optic nerve and the other vital structures so in each and every cases meticulous periosteum elevation is the must there is no other way about the periosteum elevation so though there is some controversies but ideally there should not be any controversy on periosteum elevation another big controversies are surgery versus conservative as per the standard books there are three criteria one is this an ophthalmos more than 2 mm if there is a, uh, a, a some uh, problems diplopia or fracture more than like that what question is that at what time we are examining an ophthalmos the amount of injury if there is a more edema more injury then may not be in you know, an ophthalmos so to assess that now it is we can rely on the radiology on the radiological basis only we can go for not only by a clinical examination proper radiological version we can decide surgery and if there is a trapped muscle it is trapped partially or full if there is a partially trapped so it need a urgent care especially in case of pediatric there may be other signs and symptoms there is a some in the icu few kids had admitted i say when we retrospectively analyze it is due to the trap muscle only it was undetected it was treated in icu unstable unstable pulse or whatever we are sometimes patients may put in ventilator also there is some history so that conservative we can go for a meticulous examination and even with the ventilator also now it is very very safe to do a ct scan that's a another and so conservatives i think that is a so much meticulous surgery nowadays with the help of that thing i think we can if patient wants then we can go for a surgery at the earliest tens conjunctive l approach is in our hand of course that is in our hand but as i already mentioned there is a edema so second trauma is a one of the common but it is easier cost effective moment you will start for endonasal the cost for endoscope is another even in some cases um, we can go for a light anesthesia light ga but in case of a we have a long duration ga to endonasal because the preparation time is very very long yeah in endonasal of course by a int surgeon so primary surgeon not by ophthalmologist primary surgeon is by ent surgeon so this is the one of the biggest but very very interesting is that if we need a some optic nerve issues if that vascular issues or some bony fragment etc whether it can be taken care by endoscope then it will be very very easier so there should not be any such uh, ego problem with us on that if we think for a patient's perspective patient's point of view again another issues are blunt versus forceps so during that st- one very crucial step is that moment we remove that a in the trapped fat or muscle whatever from the flexor site few says we can for safety for easy we can use a gentle by a forceps but i prefer generally by blunt blunt dissector so it will uh, it will avoid further vascular damage and it's really very very helpful by two hand technique so that's is depends on the surgeons if someone comfortable with the forcep he or she can go for forcep otherwise by blunt those are the um, blunt another big debate absorbable or non absorbable implant absorbable implants are a little bit costly are not easily available this is one of the disadvantages what very very advantages for pediatric age group we don't want any further more surgery for removal etc if we put if i put a, a titanium plate whatever that screw cost is very high and parents will ask what what happened with my kids with the plate or that and another big issues are it will prevent both the bone growth with the titanium with the screw it may prevent further bone growth so that's the reason preferably the now take home message for us is that is a absorbable ab1 which is available now so we can we can treat by absorbable not by one 
And of course, another one is that uh, with die, with screw or without screw. I, I devise one, next I will show you. That one with a mat four, I am making here a one, just a thread in posterior and that. Uh, like a, uh, in I will, we are using a, I, I will capsule like that. I am prefer, preferring one technique like in posterior pole also I make one loop and anteriorly also I make one loop. So both the loops can fix without the screw. That's uh, I already mentioned screw versus glue. Definitely glue is better than screw. Closer of course will a light closer if we if we uh, approach to orbit. Is my time is up. I am shortly I am closing. Another big debate is with PL negative, can we go ahead with optic canal decompression? So it's a big debate. Some surgeon prefers yes, it may improve, fission may improve, but controversy is that fission improve due to the um, optic can and canal decompression or it is due to the normal process. That's still debatable. So those are a very complex situation also. We can achieve by endonasal, that's one. So in my conclusion is the last slide I am closing. Endonasal is better if needed optic canal, optic canal decompression, less traumatic but costly, need multi-speciality approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Das. I think it was a very good uh, guidance that how and where, how we should go ahead. Thank you very much. It is a good teaching. Thank you uh, very much to all my convener, co-chairman and everybody. I think uh, and uh, the, I will invite. Now he is going to speak in the next session. Next, next session is I am chairing. Uh, he is going to traumatize. More. Yes. Now the... Yes, he will yeah, be there. Whole day. From <laughs> He's here yes. till 3 p.m. Okay. Dr. Natarajan, take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lahane and uh, my co-chair, Dr. Sanjeev. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev, for starting. So, thank. welcome to this, uh, uh, our, uh, the course on ocular trauma and uh, a, a true emergency. You can have one photograph. Yes. You okay. Come okay. Here. I think the first speaker is Kerobi. Kerobi? Kerobi, Kerobi, you are the speaker, you can have a, you can load your slides. All the speakers. Is it? Okay, done?